Welcome everyone. I think we've got audio. I'll wait to get started until I make sure you guys can hear and that everything, I know I'm forgetting something major. Side story, kind of funny while I wait for all this to get started. I one time had a lady get mad and go off on, I don't know why all live streamers always say, I know I forgot something. It's so annoying. Yeah, it's because we're alive and there's a very good chance we forgot something. Like there's an actual reason for that. My glasses are dirty. That ought to make it interesting. So, okay, we are good. We are here. Yay! Thank you guys for joining. Tonight we are going to be working in watercolor and going over that with colored pencil on top. That going over it with colored pencil on top, that's not redundant at all. It's your imagination. I speak good. So the project we're going to be working on is this cute little chickadee. You can get this reference photo over at my website. This came from Unsplash, I believe. And no, I don't want to set. Why would I put ads right now, YouTube? That's just rude this early on. Anyway, moving on. So you can get this reference photo if you want to paint along with me over at my website. Link in the video description. I'm going to be doing a watercolor underpainting and colored pencil on top. One of my favorite mixed medias to or combination because these two play so nicely together. Colored pencil sticks so well on top of, of watercolor. So really nice. All the supplies I'm using are archival too. So that means you can sell it, which I will be doing. You can have it, head over to my website, link in the video description if you want to bid on this guy. So one of the things you're gonna see much different on my project versus what the reference photo has is on this guy, I'm gonna make my background a lot lighter. I'm gonna do a light wash. I'm not going quite as dark brown as what the reference photo has. I wanna make the bird like, I just don't think I want it that dark. So that is the plan. And for who won the last, uh, where is it? It's over here somewhere. Who won, uh, the person who won the flycatcher from last week, it just got finished varnishing. I will ship that out to you in a couple of days here so it dries all the way. And yeah, that is good. I think we are ready. Anything I'm forgetting. Questions, please leave your questions. I, this has been the longest week in my life. I can't even believe it's Wednesday already. Like how did, it, longest and it went by super fast. How does, is that even a thing? But it's just been a thing. Like I didn't go to bed till three in the morning because we had to go buy a new car yesterday because they totaled ours. It was just, it's been a, it's been a week. So point is, I didn't do a lot of prep work on what we, you know, the topics that we talk about at the end of the video. So if you guys have some good questions, stuff I haven't really talked about a lot or something you want me to clarify that I have talked about before, leave those now. Now I'm not gonna answer them yet. We're gonna hold off on that until the project is done. We will be back to that. So if it seems like I'm ignoring you, I'm not. It's, well, I am, but until the end of the video where I will be answering questions. So if you have any, please leave that in the comments now or in the chat. Okay, so. Anything else I should have announced? <coughs> I don't remember. Let me double check. Um, auction has started, so we are good there. Hopefully there's no glitches there tonight. This guy is a five by seven, and it is going to come with a mat. And I'll show you, actually, I don't have the black mat out. I have a white mat, but the mat size, that gives you the, an idea of what the size would be. So, uh, it will fit an overall eight by 10 frame once it's matted and that mat is included. You know, actually, you know what? I didn't put on there that you needed to buy the mat separately, did I? Hold on, I better check my stuff because I might have just, because I copy and paste so much, sometimes things just don't come out right. Um, let's see, does it say? Okay, good, it's correct. Just double check in there. Okay, so. Now I'm going to start, you can see I've got my watercolor pans over here and I'm just gonna do a light wash of a tan color. So what I like to do, let's now, watercolor, to be fair, it works better when you're working flat the way that it spreads, everything's good. I, because of my back, am quite limited. I have to stay upright, keep my neck upright. So I work at an easel, which definitely makes things a bit more challenging. If you're able to work flat, it's gonna be easier. And I'm, I drew this on with a regular graphite pencil so that when I do the wash over it, I can go right over the bird. The graphite is going to stay there. Often you'll see me use water soluble graphite so that that mixes out when I use ink tents so that I don't have those graphite lines showing through here. I want those lines showing through because I'm gonna cover them with colored pencil anyway. So that is the plan. Um, let's see, for water, water, I recommend when you're working in watercolor, use distilled water. Just get a gallon of it. I've got a gallon sitting under my easel here at the grocery store. It's usually a dollar or less and it'll last you a pretty long time. I have two containers, just these little bell jars. And one is for, you can see it's got already 
there we go. Nope, wrong way, that way. A little bit dirt pink from the last project. But that is where I will be rinsing my brushes and then I have another one. This is just clean water that is what I use for the work because with watercolor, it's not like using ink tents. I don't find that it matters that much to use dirty water with ink tents. Watercolor, it does, it will muddy up your color. So we want two different ones. We, and the reason that we're going with distilled water versus, versus tap water is tap water has all kinds of chemicals, like all kinds of chemicals in it. We don't know how that's going to affect the artwork long-term, so you're much safer using distilled water where all of that has been removed. So now I'm just going to use a larger wash brush. This one is a number one filbert. This one is the Mimic Creative Mark. And let's grab some water. I don't even know what color I wanna use here. I don't think that one, which one? Are you black? You might be black. Actually, you will work. And I'm just going to thin that out. Let's get a little bit more of the brown. I need it a little bit thicker than that. With watercolor, well, this would be the same with acrylics or other mediums. The more water you add, the more translucent it's going to be. And in this case, being more translucent is going to let more of that white show through. So that's how I'm getting it light. I'm not going to mix white to lighten it up like I might with acrylics. So that is definitely going to be a difference here. I need a lot more than what I'm mixing. There we go. Okay, and I'm, I'm actually going to test that. So I have a scrap piece of paper and I definitely recommend this. Have a scrap piece of the same type of paper that you're painting on because I can test it on this. You know, I think I'd like a little bit more of a reddish brown color in there. I'm glad I tested it here. For, oh, that color is accurate on the camera. I'm glad I tested it here instead of on my work. So I'm going to pull just a little bit of like a, it's either a burnt sienna or red oxide. I'm not sure which, but something along those lines. Let's pull some of that in here. Add a little bit more water. Let's test that. Much better. And I'm just going to wash that right over everything. Maybe more water. See how, because I'm working upright, it can start to run, which is unfortunate. You don't want drips. If you're working flat, not a problem. And I'm going right over the bird because none of that really matters here. It's just a base layer. Now, if I was gonna do this just with watercolor, I would put, likely, if I wanted to do like this messy of a background, just painting over everything and not painting around anything, I would then use a masking fluid to mask off the bird so that I don't get the paint on it, but because of what I'm doing here, it's fine. And if I wanna fan that out, I can actually just grab my brush that I use with acrylics, mop brush, I'm gonna soften that up. Add a little bit more water here. I just use my fine mist sprayer so that I can soften that out, keep it wet long enough to blend all of that out. Anyone who is like really proficient with watercolor is probably cringing because this is not a normal way to work. But like I said, because I'm working upright at an easel, I am somewhat limited on how this is going to work for me. And one of the things I love, and it was frustrating for me when I first started getting used to watercolor, but as I've gotten used to it, I actually really like it. One of the things that I'm loving with watercolor is that I can lift things up. So let's say I had a brush stroke that I'm like, oh, I just don't like that, the paint ran, whatever. If I don't like it for any reason, you can rework it. You can re-wet it and soften it out. So that's about it for the, the background. I want that background just to be a very pale, very light brown. And I'm gonna dry that. Actually, it shouldn't. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and dry that. Now what I've done too, one of the things I did not mention, I used an acid-free, it's a pH neutral tape, it's a masking tape to tape this down. So as you're painting, the paper starts to warp, I can just take it, the hair dryer tightens back up, it's all nice and flat, so we're good there. Now, where I want to rinse this brush that I've been painting, I'm gonna use the dirty water cup. 
open up. There we go. Okay. I'm making a mess with all my lids all over the place. And there we go. Now don't mistake thinking all black tape is going to be, mask, be acid free. It's not or all black masking tape. It's not. You want to make sure it's one that's actually labeled for that. I don't have it. Over. Oh, I do have it over here. This is one I get from Amazon and it just, it actually says inside pH neutral and my camera is freezing up. Come on, work. There we go. I think you can see. Hopefully that doesn't keep freezing. Still haven't solved that problem. Um, okay. So next for the little chickadee. So we've got a couple of options. I can see how much this might lift. Let's take a clean brush. Which one is this? This one will work. This is just a cheapy. I think it came with in a set with something else. If I want to pull the white back in, I can lift some of that. Sometimes this may not lift that much. Actually, I want to switch to a rougher brush. I'm going to use one of my acrylic brushes for this. I don't have any paper towels out. That's weird. Hold on. That was not wise. Gotta have paper towels for watercolor. Make sure that's clean. Let's see if I can scrub some of that out. Nope, that is pretty set in there. Okay, so I'm just gonna leave that as it is and I will you I will let the, the brown be my underpainting, essentially like the darker shadows for the chickadee feathers where I come on top with the white with the colored pencil. So that is my plan now. So really, I've already got, that kind of pushes me ahead a little bit because I have more done. Let's go ahead and start with some of the black then. Let's get a smaller brush. Yeah, there's a stack of them over here. Let's see who wants to do this. Probably this one. So this one is another of the Creative Mark, the Mimic brush that I'm gonna use. Let's get some of that black. I'm not gonna go with flat black. I'm gonna get a bit of, um, yeah, you're right, Nick, he does. Nick says, Gibson looks very expectant. He's, yeah, look at him. He's not normally this alert. He's just, he's definitely expecting some, yeah. I don't know what you think you're getting over there. So I'm mixing in a bit of purples and magentas, just pulling some of that so that it's not just a flat black. Actually, I think more reds would be better than purples. Nope, I don't like that one as much. There we go. The point is I don't just want straight black. Okay, so we've got the little eye. Are we zoomed in enough? So we've got this ring. I'm just gonna use a really light hand. Now, if you like tiny detail, that's one of the things like watercolor, look how, look, look, that is the tiniest little line and it is so easy to do with watercolor. I'm not gonna worry about the shine on the eye because I can do that with colored pencil. These little details, I would actually think, watercolor I think is easier to get the tiny details than pretty much any other medium I work in. So you wanna watch the direction of the feathers as we move through here. And nothing needs to be perfect because we remember, we're gonna come on top of this with colored pencil in this case. And I'm going, I'll just use this for right now to rest my hand because I'll be moving and round enough that the glassine would actually be a bit annoying to put under my hand because I would have to keep moving it. But look at these little feathers. Like if you really like realism where there's just tiny, tiny, tiny detail, my gosh, give watercolor a try. Now watercolor is one of those mediums that I think is more dependent on good like quality supplies all around than pretty much anything else. Like with acrylics, I, acrylics and oils, I use a lot of generic paintbrushes, no problem. Watercolor, oh my gosh, the brushes you use makes a huge difference. And one of the channels, if you are really looking to go further with watercolor, check out Mind of Watercolor. He has got some amazing videos, really knows what he's doing, great teacher. He's here on YouTube. But with this, and he's gonna give you way more information because I, I mean, when I use 
watercolor myself. I'm generally using it with mixed media. I like it with colored pencil, but he does like straight watercolor and you can learn a whole lot with that. And the reason that I don't want to start with black, if I start with my darkest dark, I can't go darker. Here, I can go light, lighter or darker. This is more of a mid-range. And I will pull more dark black even with the watercolor, just not yet. You can always very, very easily make something darker. It is a lot more difficult to lighten it up. Now, because I am gonna go over it with water or with colored pencil, that certainly removes a lot of the pressure. And that's one of the things too, if you've tried watercolor in the past and you thought, oh, it's too hard, it just makes a mess. If you do it as an underpainting, it is not nearly as complicated because you can fix a lot. I don't wanna say cheating because you can't really cheat with art, well, besides stealing someone's reference photo, that's, that's more theft than cheating, uh, but, I mean, any method works, but it, it really does make it easier when you know that you can fix stuff with your colored pencils later on. See, look at those feathers. Like that is, and it's so easy to do. So we've got our beak. And the harder you push, the thicker that line will be. And this one, it is a number six round of the creative mark. It gets tiny little details so well. Bottom. And here we go for the feathers under this. And you can watch the direction of the feathers. You don't need it to be exact, but you do want these to be fairly close. You don't want to just be putting random lines everywhere. Really watch the way they clump and cluster together in which direction they're moving in. That is going to achieve much more realistic results. One of the problems that a lot of people have when drawing birds or animals, anything fur or feathers, or even people hair, they will make just random lines all over. This is weird confetti. This is not looking like anything. This is controlled, very controlled. Slow down and take your time. There is no rush here. Well, maybe a little bit for me because it's a live stream, but for you guys, there is no rush. And see where I pushed harder, and I've also got more water on, the brush was more heavily loaded. That's where I get those heavier brush strokes. And then lighter pressure here. Now you often hear me say with glassine, I like it better than using a piece of paper because a piece of paper you can smudge if you get like a little bit of colored pencil under. I don't have colored pencil out right now, so it's not even a problem. So just using a clean piece of paper to keep the oils of my skin off the work is enough. You do not want the oils of your skin on your work because people juices are not archival, as it turns out. So we, we spend the money to use light fast and archival pH neutral paper, light fast paints. We're, we're putting all that effort in, effort in. Don't ruin it by getting your people juice, hand, hand juice all over your work. Even when your hands are clean, my, like my hands are clean and dry, but it's still not good for the, the paper, for the longevity. I still need to make that into a t-shirt. People juice is not archival. Although a lot of people would misunderstand that. You guys will know what it is. And if this paint starts to dry here, all I need to do is add more water, it'll reactivate. See these little wisps, watch how they overlap. I can zoom this in a bit more. Let me pull this up. Um, there we go. And see, again, we've got that mid-range tone. I can definitely very easily come back in and add darker colors on this now. And this color is great, too, for where the whites will go. Let 
and I can just barely see my graphite pencil lines, I used a 3H pencil to draw this initial um, line drawing out. Watch how these curve. Right now he looks like he's like super spooked. We'll fix that as we move on. Don't be afraid, little chicken. I'm just gonna keep it easy by mapping everything out with the one color right now, which actually looks cool. You can leave something with just these two colors. It gives you that sort of antique -y look. I like it. Now the other thing, if you are used to working with oil and acrylic brushes, I don't know about you, but I am really hard on those brushes. Like the scrubbing techniques, like there's so many things I do. When you're working with watercolor brushes, they are more expensive because you're using higher, if, like what I was saying before, they're more dependent on higher quality. Um, don't scrub these, don't leave them in your water. I talk about that all the time. Never just leave your, ever, like not even for a second. Do not leave your brush sitting in water. Water, it will damage the, those bristles so fast and you are not gonna be a happy camper. This is so fun, like it's just so satisfying doing these little details. Look how thin those lines are. I'm gonna pull some of these feathers in from the back of the head here. Remember, we'll be coming back through with white, so it's not gonna stay this dark. But I'm gonna be using the white colored pencil, not white, um, the white watercolor. I do have white watercolor, but that's not how I'm gonna get the white in with this guy. This is another thing. The feathers don't need to be exact, but do you make sure they go in the right direction? Go for close. He's already super cute. We've got a lot of little feathers through here. I'm going to go ahead and put those in now, even though a lot of this will be coming on top with the colored pencil. But these lines, I can get thinner lines with this watercolor and this brush than I could ever get with that colored pencil. Like with colored pencil, if I want that thin of a line, I'm generally going to work a little bit larger. As we get over, we've got the leg here. Let me map some of that out. So here's his little leg. And then we've got feathers that move this way. So I don't have the lines here, so we just go for close. I may do a really detailed, like an owl or some kind of bird in watercolor uh, lesson coming up here soon on Patreon because these thin lines are just so satisfying. Maybe that's what I'll do this week because I don't have a project yet for this week. These little lines are so fun, but you've got to have the right brush. That's a must. And it doesn't have to be this specific brush. There's plenty of brushes that do it, but you have to have a good, healthy brush. You don't want one that's been damaged. He's so cute and floofy. His feet are kind of a mess over there. I'll come back to that in a moment. They're really weird, weirdly positioned. Like here, let's see, we've got a toe. It's drawn out, but I can't really see it very well. That is the middle toe goes out. And this toe curves around. Got the nail. And then a 
toe over here with a nail and then the toenail under there comes out and this looks weird right now until I get the shading and this will really be just mostly very dark. And this foot's kind of an odd position as well. Is that on camera? They're getting close. I should probably move this down a bit. There we go. And remember, if you've got questions, leave them right now in the chat. I will get to those after we get our little chickadee painted. For those of you who are members over on Patreon, if you've got a specific type of bird you would like me to see me do in watercolor for this week's lesson, let me know. I'll see what I can find. Chances are with birds, somebody's got a reference photo over on wildlifereferencephotos.com, so I can more often than not find just about anything. Not everything, but most things. Or maybe one of, I don't know what I had for the reference photos this month. little feathers on his chest here. Now I want to get anything where I want the darks in there with watercolor, anything with watercolor I want done before I start with colored pencil. Once I start with colored pencil, that's it. We're not going to be going back over anything with watercolor. So this medium, these are compatible, but it needs to be watercolor first because it's a water-based me medium. You don't want to put a water-based medium on top of a wax or oil base, which is what colored pencil is. So you're not going to do that. Now, you could put down colored pencil and it basically makes a wax protection. So when you watercolor it around the colored pencil, like the watercolor doesn't stick to it, it'll just wipe right off. So there's some cool things you can do with that, but don't plan on putting watercolor on top and having it stay permanently. It's not going to. And look when I put these little feathers, they're more clumped together. They're not, I'm not gonna try to put every little feather in there. If you paint this along with me, whether it be now or in the future, please tag me on social media. I would love to see how yours comes out. That's so always so fun. Make sure these group together, not a bunch of individual little worms. Okay, let's get the branch and then we'll do a little bit more with the values and then we can start on colored pencil. Um, let's see how much, I may need to zoom this out just a bit. See the branch. And we've got these little buds starting to form on the branches, so we'll sketch those in. Seems kind of perfect for this time of year. I know that's what my crepe myrtles look like right now. They have these little buds for forming for the leaves. Let's see, we've got a little bud right about here. Oh, 
Okay, let's start correcting now some of the color or getting a little bit more color saturation in there, I should say. So we've got more of a golden tone. I need to rinse that brush better. So we'll grab the other paint here. I'm gonna zoom back in just a bit. Okay, and I need kind of a gold. I'm gonna mix a little bit of the yellow ochre with some raw sienna. Let's see how that comes out. I'm gonna put a little bit of magenta, pull some of that in there too. Yeah, I like that color better. A little bit softer. Let's see how that looks on the paper. Yeah, I like that. So we're gonna do right in here, just a little. So I'm gonna put the lighter colors with colored pencil. So I do wanna get a little bit more of this rich tone in here. Okay, now let's go ahead and get some of that definite black, the definite dark. Actually, I need to do his eye too, which is just a dark brown. Not that color. What I should do, I don't have my, oh, they're down there. That's why. There we go, here's a brown. I don't have my color swatches out, which I should do, and I'll show you in a second what Um, what I recommend everybody do for your watercolors. And I don't have it right now. I'll put it for the edited version of this, a link to the color swatch you can download to make your own color swatches on my website. So this is my color chart and that lets me know exactly what is in my palettes over there because they, this, gets very confusing to remember which one was brown. Like I was grabbing this one when really this is what I wanted. If I had just grabbed my chart here, that would have made it a little bit easier instead of having to test on my scratch piece of paper. So these are really handy to make and I'll put a link on my video uh, or my uh, website where you can download a blank one and make it to match your palette. Okay, next we've got some of the black which I believe, yep, it's this one here. So we'll get some of those darker colors. And remember, whatever you're doing, don't stress yourself out too much about finding the perfect color. If you're gonna stress yourself out, stress over the perfect values. Get your darks dark enough, your lights light enough. This is what's really gonna make all the difference in your, the world in your work looking more realistic, assuming that's your goal. Which if you're watching this video or one of my videos, I'm assuming that's where you're going with that. But you want to make sure your darks are dark enough, your lights are light enough. This is what will control the work looking realistic. The perfect color isn't gonna make that big of a difference. I mean, it helps, it, you, the more accurate you are in anything, the better, of course, but it, let's say I painted all of him with purple. He would just look like he was under purple lighting, but he would still look realistic as long as my values are correct. I stuck my finger in that just to tone all that down a bit. And everyone often gets so hung up about which color I'm using. Don't, if it looks green, I mean, close is close enough on something like that. Is it dark enough? Is it light enough? That's what's going to make the difference. When you can stop fussing over, like really worrying about the exact color, you're gonna see your work jump leaps and bounds because you started focusing on the right thing. One of the reasons a lot of people don't improve very fast is they're focusing on the wrong thing. They're blaming the problems in their work on the wrong thing, like color. Or I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. There's some, some big ones that people will think is the problem and it's like it has nothing to do with that. If I only put the paint on thicker, okay, that probably wasn't the problem. I 
and mom is texting me the bird she wants me to draw. She wants me to paint him a walking cockatoo. I don't know if that's gonna be this week's. That would be good for pan pastels because they're so soft, the light colors. That would be more of a pan pastel colored pencil, which I could do, not for this week, but that may be an upcoming project. Or an acrylic painting with airbrushing. Okay, I've got ideas for the Moroccan. Okay, that is, my mom is watching right now. That is happening soon, but not this week because I don't think that's the, the I think watercolor, there's other birds that with the little details, what I'm going for, where Moroccans have that softer look so that, that would be a different medium I would choose. Not that it couldn't be done in watercolor, but I'm looking for something with this level of teeny, teeny, tiny detail. Plus, if I paint a Moroccan, my mom is just going to claim it for herself. I know how this works. Canary could be good. A um, oh, what are those finches? The super, uh, the Lady Goldian finches. Those would be really cool. When you get into these little feathers that are super tiny and they're aimed at the viewer, little dots are all you need. Now see here, we've got two tones. We've got some medium highlights and we've got the darkest darks. That's why we didn't wanna just go straight black here. Also notice as we get into this, look how it's almost in rows. Now not straight lines, but look how they clump together there. If you have not seen what a Lady Goldie and Finch looks like, you probably have, you just didn't know the name. Go look that up. So pretty. I would get some, but I have enough critters to take care of. Okay, let's get down into these darker areas. Now this is a little globby with the black, so what I can do, let's rinse my brush, make sure it's in the right one. And just with water now, I can smudge that out. You can spread that. It reactivates, so even if it started to dry, it doesn't matter, it'll reactivate, and you can smudge that around. Okay, a little bit more with the dark, then we'll do the branch and switch over to colored pencil. This brush, yeah, this brush smells terrible, by the way. Works great, does not smell pretty. Loof stick out a little bit further in a couple of these spots. A little bit off the dark. I'm not trying to cover up all of the previous dark areas I did on the feet. Just making a few areas a bit darker. Okay, we need to get the tone of the branch in there. More of that reddish brown with some purple. I'm making a mess. People who watercolor regularly are cringing right now at how I'm mixing my watercolor and just going on top all messy. And we're just gonna go right over that. Okay. 
Okay, and then I'll do colored pencil for most of the rest of that. Oh, do I need anything else with watercolor before I switch? I think a colored pencil will be fine. Okay. So let me clean up my watercolor. We will switch this over to colored pencil here. Come on, lid. Be smarter than the lid. Even now, I actually should wipe that down before I close that up. Let's just wipe the really wet areas so I don't make an absolute mess. Just a minor mess. Seriously, I have the worst habits when it comes to taking care of my watercolors. Don't do what I do. Okay, let's put these down here. Do a little bit of rearranging. And while I get my colored pencils out, the boys can share their message. Without treats, these puppies are so sad. Your Patreon pledge of only $4 or more gives them cookies of happiness. Act now and the bad cow gets a treat too. Oh, and you also get over 300 art lessons and a new one every single week, plus other rewards. Sign up at patreon.com slash lockery. Still grabbing a few pencils. Give me just a moment here. I'm mostly going with polychromos just because it gives me a really fine, fine detailing, but I will grab a few uh, light fast as well. I may have to go grab luminance, we'll see. these that I'm grabbing but just so I don't have to get back up although as I'm doing this I'm already cringing at having to put them away later um, did I get a white yeah I got my white I think we're good I think something out of this batch should be what I need okay so just have a random stack of pencils I just grab colors that look like they would probably work okay for me and I'm going to start with black and white. Those are really the two main colors I'm going to be focusing on here. Pencil sharpeners. Oh, I don't have the thing to sharpen my pencils into. I'm on a roll. I didn't even check to see if these sharpeners were sharp. They're probably not. I probably have to switch that out too. Well, that's not even white, that's Arctic. No, oh, whatever, close enough. That's one of the weird things with the Derwent Light Fast, the white and the Arctic. Like when you hold them side by side, like the two pencils, you can kind of see that there's a difference, but when you're using it, they look the same to me. I really cannot tell much difference. Let's see how well that shows up. Pretty good, okay. And I do wanna grab now some glassine because now I'm not gonna be jumping around quite as much. So we will stick this on here. And let's get started. I'm gonna start around his eye. And I'm gonna put that little highlight in now too. Look how well that sticks. That shows up so good. That makes me happy. And then here, the white will show up. And if the, the brown I'd put before was darker, the white would show up even more. Like it would be more of a contrast. Actually, let me switch. I wanna grab, there's a white. Where's my Derwent? 
light fast of, or Derwent, Derwent drawing white on some of this I think would be really good if I can find one. There's wheat, that won't work. If I would put things back when I was done with them, it would make it much easier to find when I need them. Light sienna, that's not gonna work. That one, nope, that's wheat again. Okay, apparently they're not in that set. Let me see. There it is. And it's getting low. Apparently I need to order some more of that one. Now remember white is not all like straight white. White is almost never white. You're gonna save your brightest white for the brightest highlights. You're not trying to make this all solid white. There's a row right in here that's really light. So I'm gonna come through here and push pretty hard. I'm burnishing at this point because that's really light, but the rest of it isn't that light. We've got a few strands. That's a problem a lot of people run into. Let's say they're painting a white cat or a white fox, something like that. Like, how do you paint that? It's just white. It's not. Really look at it. Use a color matching tool on a photo app. You will see it's usually like a blue or a purple. It's gray. It's not, there's not that much straight white in anything. Now, if I burnish, I'm pushing really hard. I don't need to blend that out with LMS in order to make it look really soft. It'll just be soft because of how hard I'm pushing. And on this guy with that detail, that is the plan. Okay, let's see, I need See if this gray will work. This may not be the right gray because it's a warm gray. Actually, on this piece, that probably would work. Yep. So I'm taking a warm gray. This is a polychromo, so it's, it gets to a super sharp point. I've got that shadow back here. I can even pull a little bit of blue in there too if I want. So I think I'm going to keep this with the warmer tones. Now this line, this shadow, look how it connects. This rounds off. They meet that highlight and this shadow. Same thing here. We've got another line, a darker shadow here, and it connects. So that's the thing you wanna watch on a lot of your pieces. Look at where things line up. That lines up with this. This one here lines up with that highlight. Look at your reference photo. Really look at your reference photo. I don't mean just glance at it. Look closely at it for things like that. That's how you're going to check your work against itself to make sure that it's accurate. Highlight out here. Go a little bit harder and make that really stand out. Now, if you've got touch-up texture, titanium white mixture from brushandpencil.com, you can also use that if you wanted to get your highlights even brighter. That would be an option as well. Okay, let's get some black in here. We've got those really dark areas. darker on the top of the beak there. And I'm gonna go right over that line too. I don't want it that bright. Look how easy it is to get all this tiny detail with this mixture of watercolor and colored pencil. And it doesn't take that long either. You just have to really pay attention to the direction. Now, it, let's say you're going slow. I know I said it doesn't take long, but if you are finding it just taking you a long time, that will speed up with time. The more you do this and really get a feel for how these feathers should go, you'll get to where you can go through these pretty quickly. But that does, that may take years to get really comfortable with it. So if right now you're like, what is she talking about? This takes me forever. That's okay. That doesn't mean you're not doing a great job. It's just one of those things that, that you will pick up speed as time goes on naturally. You don't have to try. It's just going to happen on its own. Pull 
sprinkle some more gray back here. I'm going to define this area. See, right now it's just kind of scraggly. Like, I don't have a definite. Where does the white and the black start and stop? Let's break that up a bit better now. Like, some of this in here is a mixture of, of that salt and pepper look between the two. But we definitely want to see that that is dark right under his neck here. Don't fill it in all the way. I want those light areas we did before to show too. Okay, let's move this over. Work on that wing a bit. So we've got a decent amount of gray back here. And I'm pushing, I'm giving it a decent amount of pressure because I don't want to have to burnish or not burnish. I am burnishing. That is what I'm doing so that I don't have to blend with OMS later. It looks super smooth because I'm pushing harder. But remember when you push harder like that, that's going to limit how many lemon, no, not lemon, limit how many uh, layers you can get on top. If you push really hard, you flatten the tooth of the paper. You're jamming that pencil in there. That's why it looks so smooth. But that also means you flatten the tooth of the paper. So future layers won't stick super well. So you've got to balance when you can push hard versus where you want to use a lighter hand. Okay, and as we get down here, we've got that gray. And I'm going to switch to a polychromos white because it's not going to be as opaque. It's just going to lighten in with that gray. So it gives me this really good soft blend. Whereas if I had used a more opaque white, like the Derwent Drawing or the Derwent Lightfast or Karen Dosh Luminance, any of those more opaque ones, then this would be too bold, too white. I just want it to, to blend in with that gray and lighten it a bit. bit more in here. I'm going to burnish over that again and I'm going to define this a bit more with the gray with my lines because I lost some of those. Okay. Now we are going to move over and start working on his chest in this area. Slide my glassine out of the way. And all the supplies I'm using, listed in the video description, if I did my job right, which is questionable. Let's see. Is this plain? Hold on. Sound ad. Yep. There we go. Turn that off. The ad was still plain for some reason. Okay. What was I going to do? White. see which white I like better for probably still the Derwent light fast because it's a thicker let yeah it's, it's gonna give me a bit of a softer look with it being thicker and softer here now this is another area we've got a lot of white so I'm pushing pretty hard going pretty solid but you can still see a lot of these dark areas that I did earlier we don't want to cover those completely I do want to sharpen this pencil though Shoulder Chicken is in the room hanging out with Matt and Sushi and Nugget. He can't be in here at the same time as the dogs because somebody gets eaten. Now remember with these, notice that this is not a super sharp point, whereas, let me find, look at the difference in how these are sharpened. 
This is a much shorter point because this, this lead is so much more brittle than an oil-based pencil. This is the Derwent drawing. It's a very soft lead. It's a very opaque lead, which is amazing, but you don't want to sharpen it as long of a point as you would, say, the polychromos, which is a harder lead. Still watching the direction of those feathers. Look at that reference photo. You should spend more time looking at your reference photo than you do your artwork. If this isn't something where you just glance at it once and you've got it. And that's a mistake I see students make a lot is they put that reference photo, it's right next to where they're, look, they're working, but they're not, you, they're not looking at it. So one of the things I used to do is time students you're gonna look at this for 60 seconds. And if that didn't work, we're gonna up it to two minutes. Just stare, study every little detail. You really want to observe what is in that photo. The photo is telling you what to draw. So if you, you're sitting there feeling lost, you, you're not spending enough time looking at that photo. It's got the answers for you. Like it's your cheat sheet. It gives you everything. And I don't say cheat because I know somebody's gonna mistake that and go, oh, if you're using a reference photo, you're cheating. No, that's not a thing. That is all artists who work in realism or photorealism were using photos or live models. That's how that goes. So those who think that you work from your memory, it, that makes you a better artist. No, it means you're probably producing crap is what that means. But the, the, the idea of a cheat sheet like math, you've got a cheat sheet, you've got your answers there. Your photo has the answers. You just have to learn to pay attention to it and observe what is there. One of the things I like to do too, when you hear these weird tips that people give you, they're like, you know, don't use a reference photo or just random stuff. I had a guy the other day arguing with me about, you can't use water, don't, don't use more than 30% water mixed into your acrylic paints. So this is actually a good little thing. Um, take a break from this for just a moment because I do want to talk about this. You will have people who tell you things like that. Again, the don't use 30%. He's, he was being kind of a, a jerk about it, telling me, good luck, you're going to need it. Dude, I've been a professional artist for nearly 30 years. If that was going to be a problem for me, I probably would have had it happen at least once by now. Using water with your acrylics does not cause issues. But the point of me, me talking about this guy is it's very common. You have that, you'll have people who will say, don't, um, don't use a reference photo. Your work is better if you don't use a reference photo. When you see stuff like that, go look at their art. Usually they don't even show their art. But when they do, you look and you're like, Dude, your work is terrible. Why would I listen to anything you have to say? You're gonna have that a lot where you get really questionable advice. Go look up their art. It is not what you want yours to look like in pretty much any case. Like I can't think of anything off the top of my head where somebody was giving that really bad, like just misinformation advice about art and their work was any good. There's a reason they're giving you bad information. If something sounds questionable, like don't use a reference photo, don't use an eraser, that's one of my favorite ones, never erase anything. What are you talking about? You're just making up random rules, like why? It's art, there are, there are no rules with that. So when you, whenever that happens and somebody's giving you that advice, just go look at what they're painting because it's probably not someone you wanna bother listening to because they don't know what they're doing. Okay, back to work, sharpen the pencil. Okay, so now right now, see, now right now, <laughs> grammar is my forte. See how flat everything looks. I'm gonna start pulling in. This is a mid ultramarine. I'm gonna pull in, oh, perfect. This is exactly what I want. A little bit of this shading with this blue. So any sort of light blue. And we're gonna start forming shadows in here. Remember, it's not about the color, it's about your values. This needed to be darker. It needed some sort of a shadow and I just love how this blue, my gosh, that is pretty. That adds so much to this. Oh, we're pulling that up here for sure for his highlight. I'm gonna pull some shadow, I'm all excited now. I'm gonna pull some shadows up here. That looks so good. Let's darken that so that the blue shows up better and looks like a highlight instead of just the blue line. So that is actually, here's a good place to look at. My values are not correct here, I'm way too light. So let's darken that up. Let's pull some darks in there. 
I don't want to cover it completely. I want to see some of those lights, but I don't want it to look like it's white feathers. And that's what it looks like right now. Much better. Okay. Anywhere where I've got that shadow. Oh, it doesn't look that blue on yours. This looks way better in person than what it's picking up on camera. It almost looks too warm. Let me adjust this just a bit. I need to cool this off so it's a little bit. Yeah, that's probably, yeah, that looks good. Got a little bit of this blue in here. This is the Derwent Light Fast what did I say? Mid ultramarine. Pulling that over the grays. Okay, let's come down to his little feet. Little scaly toes. Okay, I need, let's see if this actually, nope, this color looks good. This is the Burnt Ochre Polychromos. Perfect, it gives me that nice gold tone in here right under that wing. And let's say I used more of a reddish brown instead of this. It would still look fine. You just need anything to darken this up and give you that warmer tone. If you don't have this exact pencil, you're still good. Keep a little bit of this coloring up here. We didn't do that much with the watercolor, but look how much easier that like pushed us through on this project. Much faster than if I did it just in colored pencil. I'm gonna take a little bit of this Merlot. So it's kind of a, a reddish magenta color. Pull this for some of these shadows. I wanna define that a bit more than what my reference photo has. We'll be do definitely using this color with the branches too. Okay, let's come over here to the branch. Don't forget, if you like this guy, you can bid on him. He is over on my website right now. The auction goes until 10 p.m. Central Time, so we've got just under an hour. Okay, back that photo out a bit so you can see the whole branch. Okay. I'm gonna use that same Merlot for my shadow, my darker area, because I don't wanna go super dark. Like black would be too dark. This will work. It's got the little bud. I am gonna need a lighter, oh, luckily I have one out. So this is strawberry, that oh, should work. Yep, that'll work. We've got that lighter color on the inside of these buds. I say buds. Well, I guess they would still be buds. I think they're leaf buds, not flower buds. I could be wrong. Just making stuff up. If it was a crepe myrtle, it would be a leaf bud. Can you tell I'm a bit obsessed with my crepe myrtles right now? Now notice when you do a branch, see how it's not just highlight all the way on one side, shadow all the way on the other, it skips. So it's like, I've got a shadow here. I'm gonna have a highlight here. You've got a lot of variation there. Look at your photo. Don't just make an assumption when you see a branch, shadow on one side, highlight on the other because trees, you've got shadows from other branches that will just cut across the middle of the branch that make no sense as far as this is the side for the shadow, this is the side for the highlight. Really look at that photo. Like I said, it's your cheat sheet. It's got all the answers. No, it's not cheating to use a photo. 
That's not going to be my best example, is it? So we've got a shadow by this foot, another shadow by this foot. Some glassine is falling over. I'm going to take some of that golden color and burnish over the same color I used in the bird. So one of the things in your art, you can use the same colors in different areas. It will pull everything together really nicely instead of grabbing a different color all for everything that you're doing. If you can mix it with what you've already used, it will look more unified. I'm going to take my polychromous white because I don't want it super white. We've got a little bit of a highlight there. bits of that that's kind of scribbling up. And as always, if this sells, I reserve the right to do little touch-ups before I mat it because when I come back and look at it with fresh eyes, I will usually see like just minor little things, nothing major, tiny little things to adjust. Because when you sit in front of something for too long, you will lose sight of what you're doing. A few little shadows with the black and those buds. Just about done with this guy. Gonna take, let's see, a little bit darker. This one is red violet. It when I push with it or push hard, it gives me a softer, a smoother look for burnishing than I'm getting with the Derwent Light Fast. So I'll just go over that in a few spots. Okay, now it's really just adjusting little values here and there, like little details. I can see in this area by his wing, we've got a lot more with the dark feathers. So let's get some of these in here. Actually, the white needs to come down further too, though. So pull a few bits with the white. really hard anywhere where I want it to be really light. So if I make this darker, it makes what's next to it lighter. So right now it's a little bit too mid-range, so darken this guy up. Okay, let's see, a little bit more dark here. I'm using that same red violet that I used on the branch. Again, we want to pull the same color. If I used it in another area, I want to make sure it's on all the, you know, both the subject and the branch. There we go. I think it's about done. like how much darker this red violet adds to the blue in here. Okay, now when you sign your work, you want to make sure that you account for where that mat is going to hit. 
So let me pull out the mat that would come with this guy. Yeah. So he would come in a black mat. So he's gonna fit just like that. Like that. Okay, so what I wanna do then is take my, where do I wanna sign this? Probably here. And this is important because if I had signed down here thinking, okay, that's the bottom of the piece, that's going to get chopped off. I want to make sure that signature will fit within the mat. So even if you're not matting your work, make sure you're allowing for whatever mat size would fit to not chop off that signature. So that's a pretty big deal. So there's the finished guy. You can head over. If you are interested in him, you can bid. He is, I don't even know what I, what is he at? Hold on. Um, where is, oh, here we go. You can bid on him for $55. So yeah, that's really cheap. You can get a very, wow. He, I would probably sell for about 150 if I were to sell him just like, if I take him to Aquashella with me, that's probably what I will list him at. So that is, um, there we go. And what topics did we have? So we've got questions. If you've got those, I can start going over that. What was the one? Oh, I remember what I wanted to talk about tonight. So the one thing, am I in focus? Last, when I edited the other day, I was not in focus the last uh, video. Anyway. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about is this idea of if you, and I talked about this in the live stream, if you are not the live stream, the email newsletter, if you're not already signed up for my newsletter link should be in the video description, you can sign up there. But I talked about that a bit today, but one of the things that happened when I was, I did the video last week and I was talking about reasons that some people never get better. And somebody brought the, up the concept of, of outsider art. Outsider art is a really interesting com concept. There are several different definitions I've heard, but the gist of it is it was formed as a description for those who did not have formal education with art. And it's almost an excuse to just be bad. Like outsider art, some of it's kind of, no, it's just bad. I'm sorry, I just don't like it. I don't get it. If, if someone likes it, great. But what it seems to be is this excuse, and I see this so often, I'm, it's for you know self-taught artists, somebody who wasn't trained. I wasn't trained. I am self-taught. My work, I mean, what I'm doing tonight isn't going to be like super elaborate like some of my other paintings because it's a quicker project, but I'm doing the same stuff that, or better than a lot of people that came out of college. Going and getting a formal education in art does not guarantee you are going to be any good at art. You might be, but you were probably already good going into it. That is something, that, and the reason I'm bringing this up is some people limit themselves. They get discouraged thinking, well, I'm just a self-taught artist. That's not a bad thing. It doesn't really, it's not, it, it doesn't make a huge difference one way or another. Most of the better artists I know, most amazing artists, this is in the way, there we go. Most of the most amazing, most of the most amazing artists, my grammar, my gosh, most amazing artists you see on Instagram, on wherever, online, on YouTube, most were self-taught. Some did have formal training, not that many. The vast majority of amazing artists out there are self-taught. Don't let the idea of, well, I didn't go to college or I'm self-taught slow you down at all. This is one of the best times in history, I think, to become an artist because there's so much, so many resources available to you. You've got lessons, Patreon lessons, $4 a month. You can get over 300 lessons right there. That would have been unheard of in the past. And even like back when videos, you did have videos out there, you were paying anywhere from 30 to $60 for a single lesson. So this is incredible, this time in history, all the free videos on YouTube. We've got books, we have so many resources. You do not have to have a formal education. You do not need to go to college. That is not what's going to determine whether you're good or not. I know so many artists who went to college and they're terrible at art, like terrible at art. So don't, and I don't just mean because they like a style I don't like. I mean, they're trying to do realism and they're just bad at it. So that doesn't mean they can't be good, but going to college isn't the thing that's going to necessarily make the difference for you. So don't let this idea that I'm a beginner artist or when you are a self-taught artist or when you hear the term outsider, outside art, it's just it's so often 
an excuse, just kind of a cop out of, I don't have to put in the effort and learn how to do this well. If you want to be good at something, if you want, if realism is your thing, if you're interested in it, but you're like, eh, I'm never gonna be that good, don't don't limit yourself by that. You're the one limiting, you're the reason that that idea is the reason you're not going to progress. But if you will re, if you can realize I can accomplish anything, I can do anything, you will. You will get better. When I learned, I didn't even have lessons. I didn't have like there were no online lessons. I'm old. Internet wasn't a thing when I was learning to paint. This was something that you just figure out with with trial and error. You guys have it easier now because you can skip a lot of my error because you can watch a video and see how, oh, that's an easier way to layer things that that makes more sense there's nothing about being self-taught that should be holding you back like that concept isn't at all a hindrance to how good you can get okay so let's go on to the questions oh we've got a bid for the painting yay okay questions where are we my brain just shut down for a moment there drink of water Okay. Violet Sky said, are you taking steps to prevent your art from being used in AI? Is there anything that can be done? Also, can AI steal images from social media? People don't, ugh, the AI thing. AI is so interesting because people will argue they're not stealing it, they're being inspired by it. It's copying the pixels in the same order the other pixels were, that's a copy. If I did that in my art, I just wanna clarify this because people like to get all freaked out about the AI's not copying, it's copying the same way that I would and it's not legal for me to do that. I can't legally look at a photo or a painting from somebody else unless it's like Van Gogh where it's outside of copyright, you know, so old that we, we can copy that. Somebody used that as an excuse saying, well, you can, you know, artists are copying Van Gogh and we don't sue them. Yeah, because it's legal. You can't take a current modern artist and copy their work. I can't do that. So AI shouldn't be able to do it either. You can't say, well, it's just being inspired by it. I can't be inspired to the extent that you can recognize that as me copying something. Like it's the same thing, it's word games. So I think at this point, it, my understanding, and I could have some of this wrong, but we need league, We need the law to get involved. And I think that it will get caught up, it's just not there yet. I have heard that some of the different AIs are starting to limit where they get re referenced, their references or their inspiration. They're just copying pixels, it's the same thing. Reword it however you want, walks like a duck, looks like a duck, it's a freaking copyright violation. So that is not a, it, it's a little frustrating for me. But I think that we just need the law to catch up with it because it is essentially stealing. If it looks just like my art, I don't care how you worded it, it's still steal, like that is still copying. If, if you copied it at the same level that the AI is, you could be sued. So why isn't the AI? There's this weird loophole, the legal thing. It just, the law just needs to catch up with the technology. How long that'll take? I don't know. That is a concern. There's nothing we can do about it. There's absolutely nothing unless artists have the money. And let's be realistic. Most of us do not to go and pursue legal action against some of these, but because it's this weird loophole, it's just, it's kind of a nightmare right now. So hopefully that is something that will be corrected in the future, but it always cracks me up because you have, you have AI, AI, is, AI art is a weird thing. You've got a camp of people who are very unbalanced Overall, I've watched some of their videos and they cry a lot in their videos. It's kind of weird. But some of these these artists are crying literally about AI. There's no reason to do art and I'm not going to be able to make money because AI people are just going to use AI for everything. People have said that about every single advancement in technology. They've said it about every single advancement in medium. There was a point where people said no one would oil paint anymore because they're just going to use acrylic paints. And oil painters were upset about that. There, everybody's always claiming the sky is falling over something. This is not one of those things that I think is that big of a deal. The I read a lot, and I know I've talked about this a bit before, but... Um, there are a lot of people who are coming in and telling stories and they're repeating the same story of something that happened. It's freaking fan fiction. They're going to Reddit because Reddit is like land of not geniuses and, and liars, really. And they just make up these stories. Oh, yeah, well, this happened to me one day. And you're like, that didn't happen. No, no one would word something in the way you just worded it. So I know just based on that, like there's so many red flags in your little fan fiction that didn't happen. So there's a lot of stories coming up on Reddit is usually where they originate from 
where people are like, well, this one guy was, was working on a book for somebody. They were illustrating it. And then the guy who hired him came back and they hadn't finished paying him, but they said, you know what? We're not going to hire you. We're going to use your work in AI and have the AI finish it. I know you'll understand. The, the ending with, I know you'll understand was just like the cherry on the top of the BS cake that you just made up that whole story that didn't happen. These stories of people losing money and it's mostly out of the UK. They're, they're the main artists that are losing money right now. Why would it be the UK and not, this is all international. Why would it just be out of the UK? Again, you, you throw in these details, like they want to throw in extra details into their stories. And it's like, and now I know you're full of BS. Like I know you're making it up because that's not how that works. And I just, oh, it's so frustrating to me. So you've got this camp of artists who are freaking out. There's no reason to be an artist anymore and kids are gonna grow up and not wanna do art because they can't make a living from it. That's been our whole, that's been a challenge the entire history of art besides those who had uh, patrons or were, yeah, patrons like royalty or whatever that were hiring them. But making a living out of art has always been a challenge for us. So we need to adapt with it. I actually, I'm a huge fan of AI right now because I'm using it in uh, Premiere Pro when I edit my videos. I didn't even know they did this. They have an AI thing for auto-generated captions for, um, and it's really accurate, even with how fast I talk, super accurate. There's a one, it's changing the music. I don't know if you've watched any of my last few shorts, my YouTube shorts. They are the music. I took a, a song that was like three minutes long and just used this AI portion of, of Premiere Pro and edited it and it cut it in a way. It remixed the song so it sounded like it was as long as my video, like exact. And you can't even tell it cut it. You can't tell it remap, like read it. It's amazing what some of this can do. The AI technology right now, I'm more interested in how we can, can utilize it for our art. I would like to see AI get to the point where I can be like, okay, here's this chickadee, but I want lighting that's super strong coming from this side. What happens if we adjust the lighting and you could do kind of a 3D model of moving it around or I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in seeing where AI goes where as artists we can use it to do even like to, to better ourselves, to better our own work. This could be good for us, but we have too many people right now who are crying, telling us it's the end of the world. Now the copyright thing, I have a huge issue with that. That needs to be fixed. I just spit, that is super classy. Aren't you glad you are in the other room right now? But anyway, the AI thing, the, the people who are freaking out about it, they're actually discouraging young artists because they're telling them there's no point anymore. And I'm like, why are you telling people that? That's not true. That's just not true. Their art will always be a difficult job to make a living, a consistent living on. That is the nature of how art works. You've got to figure out how to, to, to man, maneuver through like all our little hoops and jumps and obstacle courses. I don't know how they're, they're I, I screwed that up, but we've got to figure that out. So that's not changed other than we're always trying to, to adapt. We're always trying to work with, uh, adjust with whatever the, how the market is moving, how we get sales, all, all of that. So freaking out about AI, th those artists, you're going to see those. There's so many videos on here of literally crying having a mental breakdown. And it's like, sweetie, you need to get some help otherwise, because this is not Mm, not big of a deal. So this is kind of a, a weird thing because there's just these two camps of end of the world. And then this camp over here saying, it's not copying. It's not stealing your work. It's just being inspired, just like an artist. And it's like, you don't understand how copyright works for artists. We can't just be inspired, AKA copy somebody else's art or somebody else's photo that we don't have rights to. This is just, it's ridiculous. Some of the claims I'm hearing on this. So it's a, kind of a frustrating thing because I fall more in the middle where I'm just kind of coming at it logically and going, okay, not based on emotion, based on actual facts on how copyright works, based on actual facts on how the, the art world works, nothing, it's not that extreme, but we do need to fix, like I said, need to fix the copyright issue, that I have a huge problem with. I just rambled about that for way longer than what your actual question was, so hope that was helpful. Um, let's see. It's just weird because it's like, there's no way to talk about it, no matter how I talk about it, because I'm in, I'm being more reasonable and kind of like, okay, I, I'm talking about both sides. I'm making everybody mad, basically. Uh, let's see. Horsewoman said, I sent you a picture to your MeWe account last week. Hopefully I got it right. Was yours the one that came through and the only way I would be able to see it is downloaded? I'm, I'm, on, I'm sorry, love you, not downloading things. So, try to upload that again because it didn't work right. And I'm not sure why it didn't work because um, I think you, I only got the one, so it must've been yours. Clark Fine Art, did you try the Daniel Smith colors yet? No, they're still sitting here and I have in perfect condition. 
and I need to do that. I need to do that still. Um, I put them like right here. They're right in front of me. I just, yes, I need to. I'm doing, I'm being dumb because I'm also like, I kind of want to save them for a good project because I want to try it. Anyway, um, let's see. Dolphin Soul, should I do flowers or spring vibes in, or should do flowers or spring vibes in the next lesson? I agree. Princess, uh, God, I can't read. Uh, well, these aren't the right glasses for reading, so that's one of the problems. Uh, Princella Gate said, love your videos. Makes me want to start back. You should. Yay. That's, I like to hear that. You should start. Uh, let's see. Annie said, okay, question. What brand of watercolor palettes are being used and what pencils are going to be used, please? So all the supplies are listed in the video description. These are all the Schmincke I paid. I know that there's better, like people have less expensive ways to do this, but these are all the Schmincke ones um, that I went with because I was being a bit of a label whore on that. And if I was going to go with that brand of watercolor, I wanted the same in that, but I paid extra for getting the label, which is kind of pointless. So I make questionable life choices sometimes. Charity said, just search your Patreon videos and you've already done a lilac breasted roller. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> Laughing at myself so hard right now. What do you uh, want to bet I found that bird through your Patreon <laughs> video? Uh, Gracie said, beautiful. Do you also sketch the picture? Thank you. So in this case, I just taped this to my monitor and traced them out to save time. I could sketch it. I could draw it but I'm limited on time and that saves time. So my drawing, I don't use, I don't always tell people like I freehanded this versus I traced this. You can't tell the difference because I can draw very, very accurately, but it's slower. So when you need to save time and most professional artists are doing the same thing. We're using projectors, we're tracing, we're using every tool available to us. This is actually a kind of a cool thing to talk about. We have a tendency to, to want to hobble ourselves. We make rules for ourselves. Random people on the internet are the ones likely to make rules and trying to tell everyone else, dictate how everyone else should should live their lives and draw their artwork. So you have just ridiculous rules of don't trace. Um, you mean don't save time? Okay. Uh, should I also mow my lawn with a pair of scissors? Is that like, I don't know why I would make it more difficult for myself because I can draw accurately. They will tell you don't erase, don't do this. They, there's so many don'ts, don't do that, don't do this. Keep your work archival. I have an issue with that if you're selling your work. I do think we need to be using archival materials because somebody is not gonna be happy if they got this and everything faded and just the color disappeared in a few years because I didn't use archival materials. So that is my one like personal rule that I, I wish more people who sold their work would stick with. Use archival materials if you're selling your work. But other than that, if you wanna erase, erase. You wanna trace, trace. If you want to make a printout on a, a piece of archival IDLA paper and mod podge that to the work and paint over that. I don't care how you make, create something that's awesome. I only care that you created something that's awesome. Use any tools, any technique, any method that gets you to create the awesome artwork. That's all that matters. That end result is what matters. A lot of people setting these rules, uh, don't use a reference photo, don't trace. They like to say, if your buyers knew you trace, they'd have, an, they don't care. No one cares. They care about what that end result is. And they don't know if I traced or I freehanded because it looked freehanded. Is that the right grammar? It looks exactly the same. You cannot tell a difference. Some of my portraits on my website were freehanded, some were traced. Go ahead and tell me which ones were which. You can't because you can't, I can draw accurately. So for those who can't draw accurately, it will help you to notice things. It'll help you to, to start drawing more accurately. And then for those of us who already can, it just saves time. So I, I don't like the idea of limiting how you create. I only care about what you create and that it was done legally. Don't steal a reference photos. Don't copy somebody else. So you know that. So I guess I have a few rules. Um, let's see. Dalton said, I'm currently painting while watching this live stream. Yay. Uh, let's see. Annie said, regarding bird suggestions, I'm a fan of hummingbirds, so wouldn't mind seeing that done in watercolor. Ooh, hummingbird would be great too. That would actually, those little details, that's definitely on the upcoming list of for sure's. Like, I don't know if it'll be this week's, but it's coming for sure. And he also suggested a rose finch. I'd have to look that one up. 
Starving Artist Collective said, after all the art questions are answered, what books, movies, TV series are you reading and watching this month? So what is it? Shadow and Bone, Bone and Shadow, Shadow and something. I loved those books. They're so good. And the TV show, I think it's Netflix. So good. Like it is so close to the books, only it's really interesting because the books, you have the initial, is it Shadow and Bone? I'm screwing up the names. I don't remember names of things. So you had the initial series, but you also had the crow, the six, the crow, the six, the crows, the something with crows. You had these like kind of two separate, separate stories, but they were in the same world. They combined them into like the same season in such an amazing way. Like it is so good. I love how they did it. You don't, I don't often think that the show is as good as a book. I'm like, I sw I'm watching this. I'm want, we're, we're on the second series now. And I'm watching it going, oh, I remember, the, like, it looks exactly how I pictured it in the books. It's so weirdly accurate. Like, it's so good. So good. So, and those books are just amazing anyway. So, yeah, that is what I'm, and I'm listening still to these elemental series. I've got pencil shavings on my phone. Listening to these, that elemental series I think I talked about last week. Um, I'm getting bored with it though. It definitely, it's it's losing me. The good, the mermaid story was great, but now we're onto the fire girl and I'm just like, okay, I'm bored now. Like you, you dragged this series out a little too long. I think I'm like on book 800. I'm pretty sure it's 800. Uh, let's see. Um, Nick wants to know all about my car buying experience. <laughs> so we went, so my husband wanted a, for those of you who weren't um, certain and keep asking questions, art questions. We've got another half hour. So if you've got art questions, leave them in here and I will get to them. But the, the car information, so they ended up totaling our car. Matt was in an accident, God, almost two weeks ago now. And he was hit by, for those who weren't here last week, he was hit by a semi and the semi, he changed lanes into Matt and then dra grabbed his car, like the wheel hooked onto Matt's car and dragged Matt with him for a bit. So they ended up totaling the car, but they waited forever to tell us. They just told us yesterday they were totaling it before they were fixing it. Well, they, it was obviously the damage was more than what the car was worth. So we had wanted to get a new car anyway. So that part was good. We wanted to get a truck so I can buy stuff for the house, like mulch that I just had Home Depot deliver for $80 that if we had a truck, we could have done it that way. But anyway, so um, that was a lot of mulch. So they totaled the car they told us yesterday after it's been in the shop for a week and a half or so now a little over a week um and they said they were going to go ahead and total it okay great and then they were like but we need to turn the rental in we're only going to cover the rental till monday uh, this coming monday i'm like okay that does not give us much time to find a new car and it is very hard to find specific like if you want something specific so we wanted a matt wants a ford maverick it's a hybrid which is good because he's going to be driving farther away for work, gas is gonna get it more expensive. So hybrids definitely liking that, but you can't find them. And he, we were looking at the new ones, they were in our budget, you can't find them, no one has them. And from what he's saying, he was reading one article saying they weren't even gonna make them, they had to stop it because they can't get the parts to make them. It's yeah, well yay, post COVID, everything's a nightmare right now. So he ended up finding a used one, it's a 2022, so it's last year's model, had 10,000 miles on it. So it, it sucks because it's like, you could have gotten a new one for that amount. You know, this one's an XLT, so it does have the nicer rims. So that helps, I guess, some. But we, they're, it's used, so they're at the, like, where they, not refurbish. That's not, well, I guess refurbish is what they're doing. They do all the maintenance and detailing and get it all fancy. So we went and looked at it. It's nice. It's really pretty. So that is what we're getting. We put, we use, we were able, because he got the job at the comic book place, we were able to then take the rest of his severance and put it as a huge down payment on the truck. It's the only reason we can afford it. So um, that, it, it worked out well, but we're still waiting. Like I had to pull money out of savings to use for the rest to cover the cost of the car because the car, they haven't paid us for it yet. And it's a whole like, thing. So yeah, that is the car stuff and we have to go tomorrow. I've got to work tomorrow, but I still have to go to the bank and get a cashier's check to pay for the down payment. It's annoying, but it's all like set. So he'll have his new, he, the truck he'll have, we can go drop off the rental car and all that will be done before he starts his new job on Monday. So it's good, but it's definitely, um, yeah, it's been a lot. Like I was working till 3 a.m. last night. I did not get so much work done I needed to get done because it just going and buying a car just takes forever. So we were lucky he was able to find what he wanted. Yeah, it was a used one, but you know, low, it's not super high on miles. Looks nice, whatever. Um, okay. Have I heard of Scott Christian Sava? No, I have not. 
Julie said, I'm trying to start my art business. Do you have any suggestions or tutorials on art business on how to start a YouTube channel, etc.?" So there are a few YouTube channels I definitely recommend. Think Media is probably at the top of my list. And it depends like what you're working on what are you focused on first? So there's so much to learn at this point, just make any video and get it on your channel. You just need to start doing, even if you never publish it, you just need to start getting content made and start learning the editing process. Once you start that, delve into the delve, dive, delve. Is that a word? That's not, I'm not using that properly. Dive into, dive, I don't know. I'm really tired. So once you get into, like you started editing, then you're gonna start doing some more advanced techniques. Maybe get a better editor. Get I wouldn't start with like Premiere Pro is what I use. It's expensive. Like I use have the whole Adobe suite, so it also includes Photoshop, Lightroom, all the other stuff. Um, Adobe, what is it, Audition? which I don't use. But you've got all After Effects and all that, which I also don't use because I don't know how. But start small. Keep it simple. When you're starting the business, start on the small, just get started. One of the mistakes a lot of people make when they start a business, and we'll use this as an example because you said you wanted to go into YouTube, but any anything that you want to get started with, they think, okay, it's really overwhelming to edit and make my video as good as this other person's video. Well, I'm gonna have to learn how to do it. I need to learn how to do it first before I upload, before I post things. No, don't do that. Start posting now, even if you don't publish it, it's okay, but I want you to start making the video, make the content and upload it. And then at least watch it yourself, have friends and family watch it to kind of get an idea of what you might want to change. But don't worry that your video is not as polished as somebody else's right now, just produce anything. But channels that I recommend, Think Media is the top of my list. Um, some of the other ones are more advanced, I wouldn't even start you there yet. Think Media is good, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other editor, uh, there's two others that I really like. Um, what is that guy's name? He has really curly hair. That's all I remember. Let me pull that up on my own YouTube channel. I don't know if I can easily do that. He hasn't posted much at all lately, so I probably can't easily find it. Think Media is at the top, so I, I would start there. That's a good place to start. Start with Think Media. Just start creating and start learning. And the nice thing with Think Media, they also will share a lot of information as far as technology to use. The cameras they recommend, things like that are really helpful. So they've got great content, but just get started. Just do, do it. Uh, make a goal of at least one video a week. Do you have to stick with that? No, ideally more. More is better, but just start. You have to start somewhere and don't wait. People have a tendency, we'll use Christian as an example, my friend Christian Ross, phenomenal music, and I say this to his face, so I'm not talking behind his back, phenomenal musician. He could go far with his music or could have, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't think, I don't know how much he's doing it anymore, but one of the things when we were in a band, this was, you know, uh, 10, 15 years ago. So we're in a band and he, his music was great, his skill level, everything was good, but he wouldn't he kept slowing himself down. There was always a reason. It wasn't like the mastering of the song wasn't good enough. He wanted to redo it. He continuously wanted to redo things. He wouldn't move forward. If he started to take a step forward, like at one point our band started to professionally record with a, a recording studio and then they decided they wanted to change our sound. But not they as in the band decided, like three members in the band. Um, I later found out drugs were involved, so I didn't know that was happening in the band. <laughs> I live in my own little world, apparently. Not all of them. Christian was not one of them, as far as I know. But, being that I'm throwing names out there, um, I know at least one of the main guys was heavily, yeah, make, looking back, it makes so much sense. But I kind of laugh at, wow, I really was in my own little world. I had no idea that was happening. So anyway, moving on. The, they decided they were going to change what we sounded like all together. We're halfway through, halfway through, you still have to pay, halfway through recording and you're now going to, to change it. So it was like this, my clip, sorry, I'm keep fussing with this because my clip is coming undone and it's making my shirt fall off. It's all kinds of inappropriate, but um, I'm super prof professional. At least I didn't spit on you that time. But he, that band, every time it would move forward, they would like trip themselves on purpose, I don't know why. And it was it was a good band. They like I was definitely the least in that band. Like I was not nearly as skilled as these people were. They were phenomenal. And they just kept doing it. I finally quit, because I was like, and then everyone else quit when I quit, because it was like, I'm not wasting my time with this anymore. But you have, the point of that story was, you have these people who can be super, super skilled, but they're so like, this isn't perfect. I want to change this, I want to change that. And they never move forward because of it. 
move forward continuously. It doesn't matter if what you produced was bad. Produce something, create something. Just get started with it. But yeah, start with Think Media. I think that's a good good place for like right when you're beginning. And just make something, make anything. Even now, I mean, I've gotten to where I'm, I've learned a lot of the cooler fo video editing things. It's just too time consuming. And it got to where, if you remember last year, I wasn't producing a lot of work because it was so time consuming and doing it by myself, I just couldn't. And now this year I'm producing constantly. It's not the same. The quality of the vid the editing is not where it was last year, but it's better than nothing. It's better for you to produce something that's not quite as polished than to produce nothing at all. So those are my tips for getting started. I don't know if that's exactly, I mean, the Think Media helps. Um, post to social media, obviously. Get a website. If you do not have a website right now, get a website. If you want people to take you seriously, have that website. Plus, you never know when Facebook randomly is like, yeah, we decided to bound your account for no reason. You may or may not ever get it back. That happens all the time all the time. You've got to have a website. You need somewhere where people can find you when one of these social media platforms either decides to ban you for whatever reason, again, happens all the time. And you may think, well, I don't, I don't get involved in drama, so I won't get banned. Neither did I. And I still got banned. I didn't break any rules. I ended up getting my account back. It was an error, a mistake, but a lot of people that have that same thing happen never get their account back. Don't trust everything to social media. Have your own website. So that's going to be my next tip for you. Get that website. Get an email list going. If you guys are not already on me, email, what? I should try that in English. If you are not already on my email list, link is in the video description. But have, have a way to contact people besides just social media. Do not depend on social media for your business. So those are my tips. Okay. Oh, new bid for auction. New bid for auction. That's what it says. That wasn't just my bad grammar tonight, which is bad. Um, let's see. What are our next questions? I had something else. What was it? actually? I'm going to move into another thing and I'll come back to the questions. One of the things that I did want to talk about was when you feel overwhelmed starting your art business or let's say just art, just learning a new painting technique, you've decided you're going to jump into watercolor. You go to, you, you see these lessons and it can be super overwhelming. There's so much to learn starting a business, so much to learn. Don't look at the whole picture. Look at one little piece, pick one thing to work on. Maybe it's just one thing that week you're going to work on. Pick one new thing to learn about. So like, for example, me right now, I, I'm trying to learn, I want to make better shorts. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do was the pop up, the text, and I'm still working on that, but I am learning. Learn just that. I just need to focus on that. I don't need to focus on that and music and getting the creative camera angle and this, and there's like 13 different things I need to focus on. Pick one and work on that right now. Master that and then move on to the next. Same thing with your art. When your art is something, it seems overwhelming. There's so much to work on. Break that project down into one square inch and just work on that square inch. Small, little, bite-sized chunks. Let's say your art in general. You're looking at your work and you're like, I want to improve everything, which I think all of us feel like pretty much all the time. But I want to improve everything. I want, I want my lighting better. I want my values better. I want everything. Pick one and focus on that today. Just that one. Maybe it's just a sketch and you're just focusing on that thing. Focus on one little thing at a time. It makes it so much easier to tackle. It's less overwhelming and you can just really zone in and that one thing you are going to master so much faster than when you're trying to, like you're too focused on too many things at once. Focus on one little thing, one little square inch on the, the project. You're working on your art business. Focus today on how do I set up a website? And don't even worry about the whole website because that could be another thing like, oh my God, there's so much to put on this website. Just the front page. What do I want this front page to work look like? That's the only thing I'm gonna work, work on today. Or what font do I like? Let's pick a font, let's pick a color. Let's break it down even smaller. What color theme do I want to go with on my website? Don't worry about the rest of the site. Don't worry about what you're gonna put on your about page. Don't worry about your gallery yet. What color theme am I going with? Tackle one thing at a time. And you can list out, make a list of all the things in your art you want to improve on, all the things on your website you want to get done. I sit there, I bought highlighters for this reason. I make a list every day of what I need to tackle because it gets overwhelming. You're like, oh, I have so much to do. Write the 20 things down and just pick one and get it done. Now pick the next thing. Break everything down, your art, your business, everything into one bite-sized thing at a time. Focus on that and then move on to the next. It, it will make things not so overwhelming. Okay, next. Oh, new bid for auction. You guys are, are, some of you guys want this, huh? I don't blame you. 
He's super cute. Did you see him lately? Look how cute he, this lighting is not amazing. He definitely looks better in person. He's so cute. And he comes in a mat. So you just have to pop him in an eight by 10 frame, stick him on your wall. Okay, next question. Um, Dolphin Soul suggestion for birds were a shoe, shoe bill stork. I have photos of them too that I took. Sandhill crane, emu, or bigger birds. I love to do lessons of faces versus full body. I'm with you on that. I like the faces too. Angela said, I'd love to see a pic, uh, painting of the greyhounds. You know, I did do an oil painting of Gibson, but I have not done one of Wade yet. I need to paint the bad cow one of these days. Uh, let's see, do I ever paint any landscapes? Yes, not that often. I would like to do more. That's one of the things I actually want to do more, but I don't, I don't like simple landscapes. I like surrealism mixed in with the landscape. So I have some ideas of things that I want to do coming up soon. Um, yes, I want to for sure. What are my favorite watercolors? Uh, well, I would say Schminka, except that's all I've used really, besides like Crayola or Praying or that crap. And it's, trust me, not the same. Like, if you wanna get started in watercolor, don't start with crap, like don't start with Praying or Crayola and think that you're gonna get a good experience, a good feel on whether or not you like it or not. You will not, it is not the same beast. Get just a couple of colors, just a handful, just black and, well, just black, really, just start with black. Just get one color of a good brand. I would rather see you do that than get 80 colors of Crayola. I don't think Crayola makes that many colors, but you get my point. So um, that's good. I know a lot of people really like Daniel Smith as well. I've not used them myself, but I don't think I'm experienced enough to tell you, these are my favorite. These are what you should go buy. I can tell you for certain that Schminka is amazing. I know I love them, but I don't have a lot to compare to, so I'm not the best. Like. I'm not at a place where I would make a video saying these are the best or this paint versus that paint. I'm just not experienced enough, I think, to give you a good feel for that. Like I can do it with colored pencil because I've done colored pencil for so long. I can right away notice the difference from one pencil to another. I don't know that I would notice right away on the higher end watercolor. So that's why I haven't done any reviews of those. Um, what part did I play in the bank? What? I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, let's see, do we have questions on here? Um, I think Nick's probably typing away at those, so I'll look on here well. Uh, let's see, there was not one I missed. Delve or dive, both work. Okay, thank you, Joseph. You know how you say something, like I read things over and over and when you say it out loud on your own, they're like, wait, that didn't come out. That doesn't sound right to me. I don't know. Like randomly the word refrigerator, I'm like, wait, that word doesn't sound right. I think I'm pronouncing it wrong. Like just super random. No? Okay, just me. Um, my little frogs are starting to chirp. Let's see. Dolphin Soul, could you have done the same look tonight with ink tents? Sort of. Like I can make the ink tents look just like this, but colored pencil does not stick as well to ink tents as it does to watercolor. I'm not sure why that is, but it's almost like ink tents sets on top of the paper more maybe, or I don't know if that, that, this is not a scientific explanation, it's just what it feels like to me. It feels like ink tent sets on top more and so there's just not as much tooth, whereas the watercolor feels like it soaks more. Maybe because I put the ink tents on so thick though. It could be that where my, my watercolor, I'm not putting thick layers. So I'm not sure if that's the difference, but colored pencil on top of ink tents, it works, but it doesn't stick as much as this does. So yes, you could. And what I would have done differently, I need to do another ink tents. I haven't done ink tents in a while, but what I would have done differently would be to go through, before I did the brown wash, where I could see my pencil lines. I would have, because the I usually go a little bit more opaque with the ink tents, I would have taken my black, my darks, and sketched out the bird, done all of that, let it dry, and then done my wash over everything so I don't lose those lines. So that would have been a different way for me to approach that. Selton said, are the Windsor & Newton pigment markers alcohol-based? They are not, um, I don't think they are. The, well, I know that they're light fast. And alcohol-based markers, the normal ones, are not light fast. Like your Copics, those are going to fade. Those are not light fast whereas the Winsor & Newton pigment markers are. Now, Winsor & Newton pigment markers, they discontinued, but now they have another paint thing that some people have said it's the same thing, just rebranded. I don't know, I haven't talked to them about it myself, but that is what I've heard. So take that with a grain of salt because I don't, like I've not confirmed it. So, um, 
Hi, Paul. Do I still use Shmika? Yes, that is what I use tonight. Let's see, we've got 10 more minutes of the auction and 10 more minutes to chat. If you guys have any questions, I'm trying to think what other, what other little tidbits of tips that I want to share. Um, let's see. I'm sure there was something. You know, I guess I can mat this guy. Do you guys want to see how I mat um, artwork? So he should be the right size. Let me grab tape. I'll get him matted. So that could be something fun to do. Oh, my tape is, oh no, I do have it here. This tape, do I have double-sided? I don't think I have that in here right now. Where is that? Okay, you guys are coming with me. I'm leaving the room. Boys, stay. I'll be right back. I mean, you're gonna be able to hear me or you should hear me as I walk through the hallway. I need some double-sided tape that I think I put in the hall lot storage closet. If I can feel some tape. Maybe it is. Maybe in here? Nope. Huh. I have no idea where I put the double sided tape. Wait, is that it? No. You should have seen how long I spent earlier. It I spent about a half hour looking for my mats. I could not find the mats anywhere and they were sitting right here the whole time. So maybe there's something down here. I've got scotch tape, but that's not gonna work. Was I out of range? It came back though, right? Okay. Let me see if, oh, it was right there the whole time. Typical, okay. So, how I map this, and then I'll come back and get caught up on questions as I knock crap over. Let me get a good mat. Did this not come with the bags? Okay, I need one more thing. You're probably not gonna hear me for just a moment because I need to go grab a bag for this. I will be right back again. Oh, I'll still need to get a photo of this tomorrow. I guess I can get a photo of it in the mat. Um, let's see. So first thing I need to do is take the tape off of this. Now, sometimes when you take the tape, if it, the Kansas Me 10s does it all the time, it'll kind of tear a little bit. To avoid that, 
and it's worse the longer it sat. Now this is not the Can 7010, so it's not really gonna be an issue, but it is something you wanna be aware of. This one is the Arches Hot Press Watercolor Paper, so I'm gonna heat this first. Notice that I'm pulling the tape away from the art. Never pull it in. If you pull it in, if it does start to tear, you tear into the work. We do not want that. So what I'm doing is loosening the adhesive so this comes off without gripping to the paper. should be warm enough on both sides now. Again, pull away from the artwork, always away and slowly. Don't just rip this off, this isn't a Band-Aid. We're not trying to do this fast. You do it fast, if it did start to tear, that's going to tear, like do a lot of damage before you figure it out and start to slow down. There we go. Now, I need to adjust this so you guys can see a bit better. The first thing that I'm gonna do is take some of the, where did my tape go? I have lost my tape. This is easier if you do it flat on a, here it is, flat on a table, but this is how it's gonna be tonight. So I want four pieces. So again, pH neutral, you can see that in there. We won't, don't just go and use scotch tape or regular masking tape. Stick pieces of that on my easel. And where did my mat go? So I wanna position this where I want it first. So get that positioned in there. Make sure it's straight on the back. Hold on. Just readjust that so it's straight. So I make sure that's all straight on the back. Make sure it's where you want it on the front. Everything is good. So now I'm going to tape just along my edges here. Hold on, I have to actually do this on my lap. I'll fold it up so you can see in just a second. But I'm just gonna go on the edge on the upper two corners first and make sure that artwork is flat because it starts to kind of want to warp up. Make sure that's laying flat. Outer edge. There's stuff on there. And I'm gonna do that on four corners. Okay, now I'm going to take my double-sided tape and this needs to be acid-free. Uh, you do not want, this one was acid-free, right? Scotch Create, yeah. You don't want just any double-sided tape. It has to be acid-free because over time, over the years, and it's not like it's gonna happen tomorrow, so you won't, won't realize it's happening. But over time, that will start to yellow the paper. I don't have a lot of space on the edge of this one, so we'll just do like this here and here. Is that flat? That's not flat. I need to flatten this. I'm gonna lift this up. There we go. Here, that is out a little bit. What I will we'll do is take, um, I'll cut that with a razor blade later. Stick one here. This one, normally I've got a little bit more space around the edges. I don't have a ton on this one. And this part doesn't matter that much. Now I've got to take the backing off that tape. So we'll just go through and do that. Um, the, it doesn't matter that you have this on there like perfectly lined up. It's just something to make this uh, stick or stay the next stage, which will make sense in a second. I'll come on tape. This one side is just being a booger. There we go. stick. Nope. 
And I know that the masking or the tape that I'm using, this double-sided tape, it costs more to make sure that it's the pH neutral. Trust me, do it. That is one thing. If you look at old artwork of mine where I use normal tape, it is brittle and yellow like when I was a kid. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is take, if you get mats, so if you get a mat at like uh, Home Depot, Home Depot doesn't sell mats. If you get a mat at like uh, Michael's or Hobby Lobby, the pre-made ones, they do not come with the backings. These backings come from Golden State Art. You can get it to where it includes the backing. If you're going to buy mats, like if you're buying a group of them, you can get like, I think I only have a stack of five of these, but you can get like 25, you can get 50, you can get bigger stacks. Get the ones that come with the bag that I'll show you in a moment and the backing. It is so much more professional looking and it's not, I mean, when you're getting a big group of them, it's fairly inexpensive compared to buying them individually at like Michael's. Okay, now we're just going to stick this guy on there, make sure it's even and then press it. And then just go around the edge where your tape was. Now it doesn't matter if this comes off. So like if you ship this in the backing, that white part, the white cardboard didn't stick that well from the double-sided tape, not a big deal. That's not a part that we're concerned with. We just, it helps so it's not sliding around everywhere. Like this is on there, like it's really loose. That's okay. Once this is put in a frame, which the person who buys it does need to put it in a frame, then you don't, um, it, it's not coming off, so you're fine. But that, and then the next step that I'm going to do is take one of these bags. So it's just these clear bags that it comes with these mats. Slide one of those out. And this is great too. If you do art shows, it is much nicer to, like if you sell prints, for somebody to buy it where they've got it, oops, turn it in backwards, in the bag. We're gonna slide that in there. And so it's all nice and protected. And uh, this has tape you can remove and fold down, but I need to get photos of this still for the video tomorrow. So I'm gonna leave that how it is. I'm gonna adjust this. I don't like right here, uh, so you can see. I don't like this, um, looks weird to me. I'm going to do some work because it doesn't look the same as the other others. So that is something that I'm going to do some slight changes on tomorrow before it's finished because it almost looks like it's coming out of the bird instead of the bud, so I've got to separate that better. But that is it, and so you've got this nice little bag. Um, this was the tape, I think the camera wasn't on when I did that part, but it just would fold down and it's all nice and sealed in there. And then if you're doing this at an art show, put your car business card in here. Or you can have a stamp made, and um, stamp, I used to do that, stamp the Lockery Fine Art with Lockery.com on it, and then it had the goldfish on it. So that is another way that you can go for doing your work. And the way that I ship these, I have cardboard that I also purchased from Amazon. I'll put a link to all this in the description later. But the cardboard, I sandwich it in and then I wrap it in a bag. It's like a clear, um, mine's a teal one that I use. It's wrapped in that, but you wanna make sure that you use enough cardboard that it's thick like a book to where if you try to bend it on your own that you can't. If you can bend that, I promise you the mailman's gonna bend it. They will try to shove things in boxes, even though it's like, do not bend. They'll bend. They do it to my husband in his comics all the time. So make sure that this cannot bend because somebody's going to try to bend it. And that's it uh, stacked between the, the several sheets of cardboard. If you've got cardboard, if you get a lot of shipments or boxes from Amazon or whatever, you can cut those into piece sizes and use that. But I needed more than what I was getting that way. So I buy them pre-made, the eight by tens, and then use mat regular masking tape. It doesn't need to be acid free then because the art's all covered and protected. And then inside the shipping bag. So that is how I mat things and then how I ship them. Now, if it's any larger than an eight by 10, I put it in a box. So that's why I have to charge more when I do the live streams where if you want it matted, I have to charge an extra $15 because I have to co cost, cover the cost of the box and my shipping. Because that though the larger it is, the more likely it is to bend to be damaged and so unless you do if i've got some thick thick cardboard i can get away with it on some of them but yeah the the eight by tens though are really easy to do the way i just described okay we are at 1004 so let me see if there are any more questions and then we will wrap this up you're right the boys do want a treat we're gonna do that tammy said i missed the moment of your talk did you uh did you or have you worked on drafting film i've used it once it was interesting I didn't love or hate it. It's definitely one of those things I would need more experience with. But it was it was definitely interesting the one time I used it. Uh, let's see, Starving Artist Collective's bird choices are pink and gray gala. Um, yeah, I know which those ones are. Um, and the same tree as a koala. Okay, now you're getting a little too advanced. 
Um, and the auction sold. So congratulations to, to whoever gets this. I am going to be fixing this little, uh, that it looks like it's coming out of the bird. So I just need to make sure it's separated and you can tell it's like from the branch. It's kind of, see, that's weird. That's how it was on the photo. But now that I'm looking at it, like now that my eyes are a little bit more rested, I haven't been staring at it as long, I'm going to adjust a couple little things on that. So I have to pull it back out of the mat. Well, actually I can say in the mat, but anyway, I have to pull it out of the bag. So boys want a treat. Um, let's see. You guys want a cookie? Yeah, there they go. You Oh, yeah, see, I've been waiting the whole time for this. Oh, my, Gibson's swallowing so hard right now because he, his mouth is watering so bad. Wants it so bad. You should have seen him. Oh, my gosh, these new treats we got. He loved it so much. After the live stream, he wouldn't stop pestering me. He wanted more, which he doesn't normally do. Okay, back up. You're too close. Ready? Okay, go boys. Gibson will take it to his bed because that's where you enjoy treats, apparently. Is that good? Did you love it? Okay, go lay down, Wade. You lay down too. Go on. Lay down, boys. Uh, let's see. Dalton said, every day when you're walking down the street, everybody that you meet has an original point of view. That is true. Um, okay. I think we are done. Oh, the ad. You are right. Thank you. We will do that next. So thank you guys so much for joining. And which one was that? It was this one. Thank you for joining. I will see you guys next week. I'm not sure what we're going to draw. I do have an idea though. I don't, let me know if any of you guys have, you know how I was talking about just the really bad artwork, like just bad. Do you have anything that you did, let's say years ago, that was, you look at your like, this was the worst landscape in the history of landscapes and you're willing to let me share it on a video. I want to take something like that and recreate it and really talk about what makes for a good landscape or a good painting because we, we were talking about that so much last week about the lady who just wasn't improving and she was doing these landscapes. And I really want to show you guys what it was, but I can't obviously use her work and I don't want to ask her because I don't want to make her feel bad if she thinks she loves her work the way it is. Um, but according to what she said, I don't think that's the case. Anyway, um, I don't know the woman, so I'm not going to go message some stranger and be that big of a jerk. But I'll just talk about them on the internet without giving them their name. Yeah, that's better. So anyway, if you have something that you're like, this is what she was talking about. Like, think Bob Ross, but really, really bad. Like, just you've done landscapes like that with little house or whatever, trying to do Kincaid, but it didn't look like Kincaid. If you are willing to let me use that as a lesson, I want to recreate something and show like how we would improve on that and, and make a lesson out of that. I also was considering doing my own painting of, um, of like trying to recreate something that's bad, but I would have to get a bunch of reference photos from other things that weren't good. I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do, but I want to do a lesson really showing you why some is bad, like picking it apart more. So like a critique, but way more involved than the usual critique. So anyway, that is the plan. I will see you next week. I don't know what we're doing next week yet. Oh yeah, watercolor. No, that was going to be Patreon. It was the watercolor bird. I don't know what we're doing the, for next week's lesson. So coming soon. Horsewoman, please try to message me again with the photo because it did not go through and I don't want to download because that's weird. Anyway, thank you guys so much. I will see you guys next week and I think that's it. Go check out Patreon if you haven't already. Hey, you. Yes, you. I see all your unused art supplies over there. Oh my god, those brushes aren't even opened yet. Tragic. You keep buying new fancy materials, but you don't use them because you don't want to waste them. Stop making your art supplies sad. Sign up for art lessons for as little as $4 a month. There are over 300 painting and drawing lessons available when you sign up, and new ones every week. Patreon.com slash Lockery.